Is Rayman still good? Rayman is a side-scrolling platformer developed by Ubisoft and was a launch title for the North American PlayStation back in 1995. Around the same time, it was also released for the Atari Jaguar, Sega Saturn, in addition to the PC. As the years have gone by, Rayman has been ported to just about everything, but on today's episode, we'll be looking at the PlayStation original. As one would expect from a game spawning numerous sequels and spin-offs, Rayman was a commercial success, putting Ubisoft on the map and cementing Rayman's place in video game history. And of course, it was also a critical success. Electronic Gaming Monthly scored the game an 8.6 out of 10, stating, If you've seen the mascot concept done to death, you've never played Rayman. There are tons of techniques and loads of gameplay that complement the cool sounds and awesome eye candy. Game Fan Magazine gave the game a 9.1 out of 10, noting, Rayman has such amazing graphics and art that it slides into the lofty category currently occupied by only one other, a stall. What Rayman has in addition, however, is deep gameplay and abundant, if not overwhelming, challenge. They simply don't come any better than this. Finally, GamePro Magazine scored the game a 9 out of 10, proclaiming, Rayman is the real deal. Playing it will help you understand what all the PlayStation fuss is about. So, is Rayman still this good? Let's dive in. The game opens with an FMV cutscene explaining how the great protoon ensures nature and people live in harmony. Then one day, Mr. Dark steals the great protoon and fends off Batilla the fairy who protects it. With the harmony of the world in disorder, evil creatures then imprison all of the world electoons for some unexplained reason. It is now up to Rayman to rescue all of the electoons and the great protoon from the evil Mr. Dark to return harmony and balance to the world. There is a hero, there is a villain, so let's get busy. Rayman begins his adventure in the Dream Forest, and the four levels here act as a tutorial for the game. Initially, all Rayman can do is walk, jump, and climb. The first section doesn't even contain enemies, but acts as a playground to come to grips with the controls. After getting acquainted, the player will naturally gravitate towards a signpost exit and move on to the next section. Yeah! Enemies are then presented and will appear behind Rayman as he walks past certain triggers. There is an audible ding as well, alerting the player something has appeared on the screen. This concept is expanded upon later, where a ding will alert the player something has appeared, even if it isn't on the screen yet. Another thoughtful touch is putting a vine right above this new enemy. Jumping on the vine will cause the enemy to leap up, teaching the player the enemy pattern out of harm's way. Make it through this area, and Batilla the Fairy will grant Rayman the power to punch, and the cleverness continues. Rayman must punch this plum, which acts like a platform to reach the end post. This mechanic is used on the very next section. A power-up floating above the water, which kills Rayman, can only be accessed by using the plum as a floating platform. Again, I must give credit to the developers for teaching the player how everything works through discovery, rather than text-based tutorials. With these three sections out of the way, the Pink Plant Woods level is over and Rayman is taken back to the map screen. From here, two new locations are unlocked. The first is a save point, allowing the player to save the progress after every level, along with level 2. This is how the next 16 levels are unlocked, beat a level, and new paths are opened up. Anguish Lagoon changes up the level structure, forcing Rayman to move along swing platforms and jump along disappearing platforms to reach the top of the stage. Then there is a mini-boss. Thankfully, the designers were kind enough to include a power-up expanding Rayman's hit points to 5 before dropping down to the arena. The boss fight itself consists of an attack phase and a dodge phase. I also like how there is a life bar for the boss itself. It's a little touch, but I'm always annoyed when a game forgets this. After the brief, battle is a scrolling stage atop the previous boss. This speeds up and slows down, giving the player a clue when it's time to dodge obstacles and when it's time to strike down foes. None of this is groundbreaking, but I like how the same level of care found in the levels thus far is not forgotten when the gameplay changes. Anguish Lagoon ends with another visit from Batilla, who grants Rayman the power to hang, along with a perfectly placed platform forcing the player to learn how it works. 
From here, Rayman makes his way to the swamps of forgetfulness. I like how the stage starts off with an NPC giving Rayman a magic seed. Not only does this help the world feel inhabited, but the magic seed is one of the best gimmicks found in the game. Rayman can plant the seed to create platforms, and then the screen starts scrolling vertically forcing Rayman to get a move on. It's challenging, but fair, with obvious patterns and offers up enough time to figure out where to plant the magic seeds before drowning. The traditional platforming returns in the next segment, along with the thoughtful level design. The platforms presented are occupied by enemies, leaving no room for Rayman to land. Right above them are plums, guiding the player to punch the plum, which lands on the enemy's head, creating small platforms for Rayman to traverse across. The Dream Forest wraps up with level 4, Mosquito's Nest. The difficulty starts to ramp up here with tough timing based obstacles. While floating along a plum, Rayman must jump over swinging spikes and dodge jumping fish. The second segment tests the player even more. While Rayman can make the floating plum go left or right, these platforms are automatic. This means the player has to navigate all of the swinging spikes with even less room for air. If that wasn't bad enough, the final segment is even tougher. This is a forced auto-scrolling segment and the screen is effectively halved being occupied by Mosquito. If I'm honest, this level leans a little too heavy on the trial and error end of the difficulty spectrum for my tastes. Perhaps if it moved a little slower, it would give the player more time to react to platforms and enemies. As is, it's awfully easy to miss a jump or get knocked back by an enemy and be forced to try again. The final segment is another platforming gauntlet before arriving at the game's first boss, the pesky mosquito. This is similar to the first mosquito boss with an attack phase and a dodge phase. However, a second dodge phase is added to the mix. Mosquito will drop three different spikes down at Rayman, each needing to be avoided. The final one fills nearly the entire screen, forcing Rayman to crawl. I forgot to mention this at the beginning but Rayman can crawl, though it is never needed until now. Defeat this boss and Batilla returns, granting Rayman the power to grab. This allows Rayman to swing off designated hooks, which of course are needed to reach the end post of this little area. With the dream forest cleared, Rayman is off to Bandland. In the opening act, Bongo Hills, we learn the ledger lines are icy. This makes traveling somewhat tricky, but also adds some momentum to the physics, allowing Rayman to slide in addition to gaining speed while moving downwards. Eyes are also introduced, which shoot lightning bolts at Rayman right after they blink. It's a hazard utilized for the rest of the game, so it's important for the player to understand the timing and visual cues here in Bandland. Finally, various cloud platforms are introduced. Some disappear after jumping on them, some act like bouncy springs, and others move back and forth. Finally, there are little elves, causing Rayman to shrink. This is useful for tackling this bug enemy. This thing likes to duck, and being shrunken down allows the player to smack its head quite easily. Understanding this concept will make future encounters a lot less annoying. The second segment starts laying it on thick with the automated platforms over beds of spikes. The third segment forces the player to traverse up the stage on a rocket. The rocket can be controlled by moving left and right on the platform, but with how fast the screen scrolls it can be difficult to avoid crashing into spikes and especially difficult avoiding moving enemies. The fourth segment doesn't let up either, with a ton of eyeball hazards and small platforms with roaming enemies on them. The fifth segment includes rotating platforms over a bed of spikes while requiring the player to avoid stationary spikes and enemies. Make it through this and a sixth segment is presented, which is another gauntlet. All in all, Bongo Hills is a huge level filled with tons of hazards. Allegro Presto is all about using the icy platforms to manipulate the game's physics. Rayman can maintain momentum to slide under hazards as well as gain speed down hills to make spectacular leaps. While this is inherently fun and entertaining, the areas with small platforms are decidedly not. Seriously, landing on these without the momentum carrying Rayman to his doom is nearly impossible. While Rayman features decent jumping mechanics, he cannot change directions easily, meaning course corrections are near impossible. I found it best to utilize the hang ability. 
make it through this, however, and Batilla gives Rayman helicopter hair, allowing Rayman to hover for a short while. The third Bandland level is Gong Heights. After platforming over a level entirely over a bottomless pit is a force scrolling level. Strangely, touching the edge of the screen kills Rayman instantly, rather than pushing him along. The spikes, eye hazards, and the death scroll make for an experience similar to the previous auto-scroller, where previous knowledge of what's ahead is the only way for a player to be successful. Survive this and the final band level is next, Mr. Sax's Hullabaloo. The first segment is a blend of icy physics, collapsing platforms over spikes, and small platforms with enemies, while the second segment is a chase level with Mr. Sax. You can score a few hits as well by hitting the notes back into him, clear the chase, and the player then arrives at the real boss fight. Like the boss fight against Mosquito, the fight is all about memorization. Die a dozen times while learning all of the patterns and it becomes easy. I found this triple bomb attack to be especially maddening, but once I figured out the exact location to crawl, dodging it becomes routine. But man, the journey to learning it was tough. Defeat the saxophone and Rayman can progress to the third world, Blue Mountains. The eighth level is Twilight Gulch. While the grabbing mechanic was introduced long ago, the Diviners really started utilizing it here. Plenty of practice was offered for players who wished to travel off the beaten path and master the mechanic earlier, which is then reinforced from here on out. There are also exploding lava rocks, where the player needs to learn how they explode and then find safe spots to avoid taking damage. Another gimmick reinforced are those trigger events. Right away at the beginning of the game, a chime would sound and then enemies would appear. Here, after reaching a certain spot on the screen, a cloud will appear. Failing to trigger this event and progress forward is impossible. This first segment of Hard Rocks is made of long rides on moving cloud platforms where the player needs to jump, duck, and punch at the appropriate times to avoid getting knocked off the cloud to the death pit below before moving on to some traditional platforming. Mr. Stone's Peaks then brings back an NPC and a new gimmick. After freeing his guitar from a boulder, he gives Rayman a blue drink, which offers super helicopter hair. This is level specific, and the first segments of this level require its use. Based Basically, the player needs to occasionally press the jump button to keep Rayman in the air. Unfortunately, the ceiling, floors, and walls are usually covered in spikes, requiring a delicate touch. To make matters worse, there are plenty of moving spikes, making progress even more treacherous. Reach the end and Rayman finds himself below a falling platform. Here, the player needs to avoid the bird enemies, which charge at Rayman, while also using the super helicopter hair to break through the rope to stop its descent. Fail to do this in time and Rayman will get crushed at the bottom of the level. Then it's time for more platforming up a vertically scrolling level. Survive the flood and the level ends near the summit, complete with snow and some more icy platforming before arriving at boss number three, Mr. Stone. By now, the pattern set forth is pretty clear. Mr. Stone has a dodge phase where various projectiles must be avoided, followed by an attack phase where Rayman can finally score some damage. Fail to memorize the patterns and you're bound to take damage. There is simply little room for error. As you're probably getting sick of me describing each level in detail, let's go ahead and summarize the final two worlds. The gimmicks presented are similar, and the gameplay mechanics remain the same. Eraser Planes mixes the berry gimmick from the opening level with plenty of moving platforms and pits filled with ink, offering one-hit kills. This concludes with the mini-boss against a Viking pirate lady. She shoots knives, which either need to be avoided or used as a trampoline to finally land some hits. From here, Rayman has to platform through Pencil Pentathlon and Space Mama's Crater, which continue the onslaught of automated platforms and ring jumps over bottomless pits. Make it through the obstacle courses and the fourth major boss is revealed, Space Mama. The fight is a touch more complex than the battles preceding it. First is a simple game of cat and mouse, where you land a hit when her head is exposed and then dodge her laser attacks. After this is the dodge phase, where the player needs to run and crawl around the screen dodging various bomb formations. Finally, there is the washing machine phase. During this segment, the player must land hits on the washing machine acting as a shield. Even after a couple of playthroughs, this segment right here caused me quite a few deaths. Dodging the 
laser attacks is hard, as is avoiding the washing machine after it's been destroyed. If you manage to take down Big Mama, a cutscene plays alerting the player Mr. Dark has kidnapped Batilla the Fairy. From here, we're off to the final three levels in the Caves of Scops. A majority of Crystal Palace is old hat. There are tons of small platforms over death pits, tons of hanging jumps over death pits, and tons of rotating spikes over death pits. Eat It Shows features a segment where the caves are dark and the only thing visible is Rayman and his flying fist. Mr. Scop's stalactites is like a roller coaster along some electrical lines while riding small platforms. But mostly, it's hard platforming over spikes and death pits. Past the test and Rayman are arrives at the fifth boss, Mr. Scops. Like Mr. Sax, Mr. Scops is broken into two stages. First, the player needs to survive a trio of obstacles. First, collapsing platforms, then more collapsing platforms, and finally, some hanging jumps. Clear this and it's time for the real fight. Strangely, despite being a late boss, this one is short. While he attacks with his tail, punch him in the face, then jump over his claw attack. Both the attack and dodge periods are short and this boss can be cleared quickly. After clearing the 17th level, nothing happens. There is a location on the map appearing to be a level, but a path doesn't open. It turns out there is still a ton of work to be done before the player is allowed into the last level. During the opening cutscene, the game mentions the Electoons have been captured. In order to access the last level and take on Mr. Dark, Rayman must locate and destroy each and every cage found in each and every level. You'll notice on each level is a medallion with six spaces on it. When an Electune is freed from a cage, an Electune face will fill one of these empty spaces. Find all six cages on a given level, and the entire medallion turns into an Electune face. Some of this involves backtracking, as some cages in earlier levels require the use of upgrades received in later levels. Once the final power-up is acquired, the run upgrade, one could conceivably collect all of the cages from that point forward with no backtracking. Still, it is a bit unusual for a game to require a full 100% completion to unlock the final level and receive a conclusion. Typically, a bad ending is shown, offering a conclusion with a good ending being rewarded for those who choose to complete the game. There are a few differences when revisiting the levels, however. First, there are no sub-bosses or main bosses. These are simply skipped when going through the different segments of the levels. I can't help but wish the game let you exit a level though. Bongo Hills is a whopping six parts, for example, and having to travel through all six parts when you just needed one or two cages is a waste of time. You can exit the first part of any stage, however, as there is an exit sign found at the beginning of all 17 levels. Perhaps including this for all segments after a level has been beaten would have been a way to reduce what feels like padding. So, once you go through all 17 levels freeing Electoons from the 102 cages, the final level can finally be reached. Candy Chateau consists of a single level, Mr. Dark's Dare. The first segment is a sledding level, where you need to keep your momentum going with well-timed jumps over icy icing. The second segment has Dark Rayman chasing the player. He does mirror your movements so it's easy enough to keep him behind you, but you can't stop for obvious reasons. One should also keep their backtracking to a minimum. The third segment offers a new gimmick. The controls are mirrored. Left is right and right is left. Clear this and next is an auto running section. Not auto scrolling, auto running. All you can do is make Rayman jump. Clear Mr. Dark's dare and we finally move on to the final boss fight. The first segment is a tease. Mr. Dark forces the player to dodge two fire attacks while stealing Rayman's ability to fight back. After a while, some Electoons will bring the fist power up down to Rayman, and Mr. Dark flees. Yeah, he flees and you never see the main villain again. Instead, the final fight is against three mashups of previous end bosses. First is Mr. Scops and Mr. Stone, then it's Mosquito and two Space Mamas, and finally, Mosquito and Mr. Sax. Unlike the individual boss encounters, these are well relatively quick and easy. They don't feature extensive dodge phases, taking most of the trial and error memorization out of the equation. I wouldn't call any of them easy by any stretch, but compared to what one endured to get here in the first place, the trio feels relatively tame. 
The reward for beating the final boss is also tame, with a brief cutscene announcing Rayman has saved the world. All that work and this is all you get. Then of course, the credits roll. Graphically, Rayman is a terrific looking game. On a technical level, the sprite work feels like a step above what would be possible on the previous generation of game consoles. Enemies are large, detailed, and full of color. Additionally, everything features a ton of animation. Some of this is due to the increased memory of the hardware, allowing for more frames to be stored. Part of it is also because of the fact most complex characters lack limbs. This means hands and feet can move around without needing additional animation frames. The combination of both techniques allows Rayman to look exceptionally fluid. The next generation level of detail is also carried into the set pieces. The opening Dream Forest levels in particular are excellent. There's a ton of color in the backgrounds, in addition to multiple levels of scrolling, offering the best of both worlds compared to the previous generation of hardware. There are special effects as well, like fog, rain, along with some other trippy effects really pushing Rayman over the top from a technical perspective, and it does all of this at a silky smooth 60 frames per second. It will dip briefly when the screen gets too busy, but these moments are infrequent. While technically excellent, Rayman is also artistically sound. Many of the backgrounds have a painting-like quality to them, helping the world of Rayman feel dreamy. Sprite work follows suit. It lacks the pre-rendered three style that was prevalent at the time, and it's not realistic either. Instead, Rayman maintains the dreamlike quality of the backgrounds with some cartoon-like aesthetics. I assume this is what they were going for considering everything is called a tune, electune, anti-tune, pro-tune, etc. I also love how the worlds feel alive. This is especially true in Dream Forest, with little mushrooms bouncing about and flowers grooving to the music. I should also note the outdoor areas of Dream Forest the Cave of Scops and Blue Mountain tend to feel more rich than the theme worlds of Bandland and Picture City. Matching the excellent visual presentation is some equally impressive audio. For starters, two of the tracks are the ultimate earworms, and despite being a few days removed from playing the game, I can hum these to myself without an issue. They are just ridiculously catchy. The rest of the soundtrack isn't too shabby either. There is ambiance, some jungle music, suspenseful tracks, garage band jam sessions, jazz, chanting, funk, and even new age. It's all absolutely fantastic and there isn't a weak track found in the entire game. They set the mood for the stages at hand, enhancing the different themes of each level. The sound effects are nice as well. All of Rayman's maneuvers like landing, changing directions, punching, and even his helicopter hair, making a subtle though cartoony sound matching the overall tone of the game. There really isn't much to say, Rayman simply sounds Sounds amazing. So, with all of that out of the way, we arrive back to the question asked at the beginning of the video. Is Rayman still good? Rayman is a game I've enjoyed for at least a decade now. The excellent presentation, smooth gameplay, and varied level gimmicks offer up a decent platforming experience almost anyone can enjoy. However, up until this review, I had never beaten Rayman. Somewhere around the pencil jumping in Eraser Plains, I would grow disinterested and shut the game off. For this review, however, I finished every single level, beat every single boss, and destroyed all 102 Electune cages, and saw Rayman through to the very end. With that frame of reference, let's take a deeper dive to find the answers I'm looking for. 
If there was one word to describe the gameplay in Rayman, it would be hard. Rayman will kick your ass. As soon as the fourth level, the gloves are off, and Rayman starts introducing some ridiculous challenges. Take a look here. I'm jumping towards the platform while it is still moving towards me, yet the platform manages to change directions and speed away before I land the jump. It is here, in the fourth world, where Rayman changes. The first three worlds are filled with these clever sections, slowly introducing the player to new mechanics before cranking up the difficulty, but the careful attention to detail and thoughtful progression never returns. Instead, Rayman turns into a trial and error fest from level 4 all the way through level 18. The riding platforms in Bongo Hills contain spikes almost immediately, making success on a first try a near impossibility. Allegro Presto has sliding jumps leading to death without knowledge of what's ahead beforehand. A blind jump here is necessary to trigger a platform. Touching the edge of the scrolling screen kills the player instead of pushing them along in Gong Heights. The chase sequences in Twilight Gulch give the player little time to react to oncoming hazards. Instead, the player must learn from their mistakes. The tight corridors of Eraser Plains are just insane, with thumbtacks damaging from above and the ink killing from below. This rope section here is pretty obtuse. It is presented like a dodging obstacle, but nope, you're supposed to cut the rope with the helicopter hair. I'm sorry, but it took numerous deaths before I figured this out. If the rope obstacle was presented first in a logical way like the berries, then this wouldn't have been so bad. In Space Mama's Crater, you can't grab this second ring. Of course, you don't know that until you fail. And good luck in hard rocks. Hazards pop up at the last moment, requiring either a jump or a punch to defeat. Perform the wrong action, and there simply isn't enough time to correct your mistake. You have to have it memorized. I'm not nitpicking here either. Nearly every level in Rayman is filled with trial and error gimmicks requiring memorization to proceed. Worse yet, Rayman has limited lives and just a handful of continues. This is somewhat pointless as the game features multiple save slots along with a password system. Still, with levels featuring as many as six different segments, blowing through the limited life stock on the first few attempts is very easy. Thankfully, Ubisoft programmed cheat codes effectively giving the player either unlimited continues or unlimited lives. As you can see from the life counter, I opted for the 99 lives, and even then I had to reload a couple of times. The game is seriously filled with so many BS surprise moments it took me over 100 lives just to get through the first 17 levels. And this was not my first playthrough. The biggest offender of all are the bosses. Each and every one is completely unfair. The first time Mosquito does his diving attack across the bottom of the screen, he appears behind his life bar. And when he carries this giant spike across the level, Rayman needs to duck under it. Yeah, it's clearly touching him, but he doesn't take damage. This is the opposite of what happens during the Space Mama boss. I clearly stand upright as the laser blast passes by Rayman's head. Yet I still take damage. This bizarre collision behavior occurs on these thumbtacks as well. Sometimes Rayman passes by without issue, other times he takes damage. It's as sloppy as it is frustrating. But back to the bosses. Like the platform in the fourth level, every boss features attacks the player has to learn ahead of time. If you aren't in the right position at the right time, there is no hope for survival. Sometimes the attacks look identical and then change at the last moment. The challenge isn't overcome with quick reactions, dexterity, and skill, but rather pure trial and error. If Rayman was a 45 minute 8 bit title with unlimited continues, this style of challenge would be much better more palatable, but from a 10 hour game with limited lives, I find it far less acceptable. On top of the BS are gimmicks containing little fun. Both Super Hair helicopter levels are devoid of enjoyment. Rayman carries way too much momentum, meaning careening into spikes is way too easy. Instead, these must be completed at a snail's pace. And even then, some of the hazards require pixel perfect precision. A few nitpicks I do have are how the tings reset when Rayman dies. An extra life is earned when Rayman naps 100, but because the counter resets upon death, it's an impossible task. The knockback is also obnoxious. 
Especially considering the massive amount of death pits in the majority of the levels. When you combine the knockback with the trial and error gameplay, limited lives, and the overall insane difficulty, one can't help but feel the designers were trying to screw with the player from beginning to end, rather than challenge and engage the player. Finally completing the game, it's easy to see why I spent a decade shutting the game off rather than pushing forward. Rayman just isn't very fun. And when you do force yourself to finish the game, it gets even worse. Some of the tasks required to grab these crates are damn near impossible. I can't tell you how many dozens of times I missed this jump right here. You have to run, then jump at the exact right moment, engage the helicopter hair at the exact height of the jump, and then throw a punch again at the exact perfect moment to snatch this ring. That is three pixel perfect button presses just to grab the hook. Then you have to jump off the hook at the right moment to gain height. And no, the jump isn't at the height of the swing, but somewhere in between. It's absolutely maddening. Or this crazy which requires a number of triggered events in order to unlock the cage. One of those triggers includes jumping at this spot. Fail to jump between these two random pencils, and you cannot beat the game. Seriously. Or how about this tiny obscure platform blending in with the water, which instantly kills Rayman? Fail to spot it, and you can't beat the game. These sparkling platforms are bouncy, and you have to bounce underneath thumbtacks as Big Rayman, which is insane. Speaking of sparkly platforms, at one point you need to navigate downwards, even though the tightly spaced platforms bounce you upwards. At times it feels like no one bothered to playtest the game before shipping it, which according to this blog post on the official Ubisoft website is exactly the case. How does this even happen? Even some of the one-off gimmicks are implemented better in older games. The sledding section, for example. Get it wrong and you are just sorta of stuck. This doesn't happen in Chuck Rock 2, Son of Chuck, released two years prior. The light section is also a pain, with enemies hitting Rayman that are impossible to see, over death pits no less. This doesn't happen in Mickey Mania, which features a much larger light window, allowing a fair chance to see enemies and no bottomless pits, so Mickey doesn't die when you miss a platform you might not have seen. This was released one year prior. So, with all of that in mind, I would say Rayman is not very good. I'm not saying this is a bad game, but the design elements used to challenge the player feel incredibly dated. The trial and error gameplay with the surprise hazards and questionable enemy placement lack the polish found in the visual and audio department. The challenges, which are actually fair and presented in a way the player has a chance at success with skill alone, are long marathon levels. These days, these types of mechanics would be presented as short levels, offering quick satisfaction upon completing a few brutal tasks. Combined with unlimited lives and quick respawns, and this style of hard can be rewarding, but in Rayman, the satisfying moments of completion are way too far apart, resulting in an exhausting gameplay experience. Rayman is alright, I guess, and I was able to overcome each and every obstacle the game threw my way. Nothing here is possible and thanks to extra life cheat codes, completing the game is a possibility for gamers of average skill. But the journey to completion is often more frustrating than necessary, and I can't help but go back to how wonderful the opening levels are and wonder what Rayman could have been if the design philosophy implemented here was carried throughout the rest of the game. Unfortunately, when I break down the game elements and look at them with an objective eye, I find Rayman underwhelming, frequently unfair, and at times utterly broken. Broken.